Hi everybody, welcome to the QB School. I am JT O'Sullivan. Today we are talking clock mismanagement. My goodness, how can so many things go astray late in the game, situational football? We are breaking it down, trying to provide some kind of underlying foundation too as we do so. So fired up for this one. Let's get into it. Welcome to the QB School. So in this video, we are talking clock mismanagement. But to talk mismanagement, we really need to talk about the foundations of clock management in football and really going to try to blend in some anecdotal experiential stuff with some kind of foundational learning. Not going to pretend that I have all the answers by any means, but I will tell you from playing, from coaching, I do think that I maybe value certain things a little bit more than others, but they're not just solely from my own experience. I do take a lot from this book, as I think many people do in the football world, when we're talking clock management, Homer Smith, kind of the seminal piece here, and I don't freak out about the cover and who's on there. I think there's actually been uh, a few different revised editions. In short, and I'm gonna first acknowledge my own bias. I think timeouts are very, very important. I do not like spiking the ball. And when we talk about what that means and how I got there, but really the foundation of it is from this book. Now this book is not light reading. It's not a big book, okay? but it's not the easiest beach read. Okay, so if you're looking to kind of expound upon many of the things that are kind of touched on in this video, I recommend it. If you coach or have aspirations about being a head coach or having anything to do with time management, I recommend it. I'm sure that there are other sources out there, but for me, by far the most influential. So now let's talk timeouts and spiking the ball. Because I think these are the kind of, the ones that come up the most, and I feel like they come up the most, obviously, in the NFL the most, because you're going to have a lot of, you know, like teams that games are going to come down to one-score games, depending on what level of football you coach, play at. That might not be the case. You might not be in a whole lot of, you know, one-score games over the course of your high school football career, just because you're on a great team or you're on a not great team. And so there can be this kind of fluctuation with people's experience with it. But for me personally, okay, now I acknowledge that I think timeouts are very important. In fact, philosophically, I don't think I, in three years of being a head coach at the high school level, I don't think we ever, quote unquote, burned a timeout or used a timeout because, you know, of we didn't have enough guys on the field or we we're going to get a delay game. We just philosophically don't believe it. I will never take, not almost never, uh, give up. I'd rather take the five-yard penalty than lose a timeout. So the analogy that I use is pretend your team, whether you're a fan, player, coach, whatever, gets a delay a game, a false start in the middle of a first quarter, third quarter, anytime. If you could give up a timeout to not take those five yards, so there wouldn't be a penalty, you would just lose the timeout, would you do that? I wouldn't. <laughs> That's a hard F, middle finger, no. Not doing that. Take the five yards, whatever. I need the timeouts. Why do I need the timeouts? I think that the timeouts basically allow you to have extra plays. So if you're down in a game, a timeout to me saves 40 seconds. How many plays can I get off in 40 seconds? Depending on what level of football you're at, you know, depending on who you talk to, at least five, maybe upwards to seven to eight if you're talking incomplete passes. So do I value seven more plays than five yards going backwards in a series early in a half? Really, any time in a half? I value the plays. I want more plays. So anytime there is a burnt timeout, I think that you are giving up seven plays a half, six, seven plays a half. That's just my philosophical approach to it. And it got so much so at the high school level that I think players and coaches would feed off the other team burning a timeout. They don't value plays as much as we value plays. We want as many plays as possible. They don't want to play. They're okay with not having as many plays. And I think that burning a timeout does alleviate stress and you'll hear a lot of people say, well, you can't take them to the locker room with you. They're not wrong, but they're not totally right either. Because if you need them at the end of a half, 
to give you extra plays to get yourself an opportunity to score that makes a difference in a one-score game, you sure as hell need them in your pocket. And so to burn them in the first part of a half, or really any part of a game, is just simply mismanagement, in my opinion. So that's the part of timeouts. So now, there will certainly be times where you get to the end of the game, and maybe you've already used all three timeouts to stop the clock and get the ball back, and you've done great timeout management. Now let's talk about spiking the ball. So, this is a, a, a massive pet peeve for decades in football. I do not understand spiking the ball. I can really only think of a handful of instances where you would ever want to do it. In my opinion, it is strictly to relieve pressure for everyone involved. So you get a better play call, people are tired, uh, you know, I get it that it stops the clock, but unless you're in a really specific situation, and we'll talk about it, you almost never need to do that. Just about every team at every level should, and most do, have one word play calls that they can get in in any situation. And you have to have that dialed up ready to go and whatever the personnel is on the field, when you're in that situation, late game, and you got the ball in bounds, the clock's not going to stop, get up and call a play. Do not clock the ball. I repeat, do not clock the ball, almost ever. Why would you want to give up 25% of your plays? It, it, like, you don't have to be a math savant. We're not talking like advanced calc here. We're not talking quantitative research to know don't give up 25% of your opportunity to win. It's just that simple for me. Like that That's it. In fact, coaching at the high school level, the first year, uh, you still couldn't spike the ball from shotgun. We didn't have a spike play. We only went shotgun. You can't spike it in shotgun or you couldn't at the time. In three years of coaching, we talked about spiking the ball maybe once or twice. We never practiced it in a game. It never came up in a game. I do not believe in spiking the ball. You have to have a call ready to go. Do not feel like just to spike the ball and relieve the pressure. To me, that is clock mismanagement. You should have prepared for this situation as a coach, as a team, as an organization, as a quarterback, before you're in it. And if you have, you'll have a play ready. And you don't have to have the same play for every single situation, but a handful of different really quick one-word calls is not difficult. It's just not. And to go up there and waste 25% of your opportunity to win a game is simply inexcusable. And it, it's bugged me forever. And when it unfolds to end the season, it's just, I can feel like the tinge of pain for everyone associated with that organization because it's brutal and it's mismanagement and it's revealing and it's unbelievable that it happens at the absolute elite level of sports, but sure as hell it does. And it's just so frustrating on certain levels. And I just want to make sure then I talk about this, the spiking to waste it. Yes, you use, you lose 25% of your plays, right? You burn it down. Yes, it stops the clock. It relieves the pressure, but it also relieves the pressure for the defense. They're on their heels. We got them going. We, we're, we got a chance to win the game. If we can get up with a one-word call, control the tempo, control the pace, we are relieving the pressure for everyone, for the coaches, for the decision-making, to catch our breath, all of it. We have the advantage, so why would we want to give up the advantage by stopping the clock, relieving the pressure? And then finally, the really the only time that you ever want to spike the ball, and again, I'm sure that there are other instances, and if there are, and you're so burning to be right in the comments, knock yourself out. But for me, the only time I really would ever spike the ball intentionally is if we have to kick a field goal to win a game, the clock is running, and there's anywhere from like six to three seconds left. Because if there's anything less than three seconds left, ask the Cowboys, you can't spike the ball. You don't have enough time. Anything more than six seconds, we're gonna run a play. So it's no timeouts, gonna kick a field goal, wanna get the field goal unit on the field. It's not fourth down. Please don't spike the ball on fourth down. And between six and three seconds, kick a field goal to end a half, that's it. Now, I'm sure that there are other outlier instances that I'm not thinking of, but that's the core way that I think about it. Between seven, three seconds, kick field goal, end of half, only time spike a ball. Every other time, we are going up there to the line of scrimmage to run a play as quickly as possible. We're going to have sideline plays. We're going to have end zone plays. 
Now, it doesn't mean you have to throw up a jump ball. You be, be so smart with the ball. But you can't burn 25% of your opportunity to win. You can't. It's It just hurts my soul, man. It hurts my football soul. I don't care who wins these games this weekend. I really don't. But I do. It just, especially when, you know, just, <laughs> it's tough. So let's watch some film here to see exactly what I'm talking about. I'm not really going to talk much about the timeout elements, although I do want think it's important to better understand timeouts. And if you realize timeouts are seconds, 40 seconds, if you're down, 40 seconds, six, seven plays. If you're willing to give up six, seven plays as opposed to going backwards for five yards, you know, maybe we just philosophically differ about what's the most important thing in football. But that's my personal approach to it. And then clocking the ball. I mean, so many different reasons not to do it. Don't relieve the pressure. Don't give up a quarter of your plays. Man, frustrating. Clock mismanagement. All right, here's some video. Let's take a peek. So Raiders at the end of the Bengals game here. Third and long. We're going to get a completion. There's 40-ish seconds left. We're going to get a completion on a little curl for a first down. Then we should run up at this point and run a play. I think the worst bare minimum you're going to run here is just two by two four verts and take a shot on the outside with a jump ball fade. The, you have to have this play. There is no reason to spike the ball here with, let's see how what the clock is. Oh my God. So I'm not sure that this is the right clock. That's the clock from the last play. I think it's at 17 seconds. You come up and spike the ball. You can't. And you can see here, he's got the little quick out potentially. Just, you know, throw the quick out, throw it over his head, throw it to where only he can catch it. But to waste 25% of your opportunities to win here, because you're inside the 10, you're not going to get another series of downs. And let's say, even if you, so let, let's go back here. Even if you, so you waste 25% of your downs, and let's say the next, within the next three plays, you get a defensive pass interference, and you get another set of downs. Well, you wasted seconds spiking the ball, so you might not get that many plays in. So we got 29 seconds. That was the time. So you're going to spike the ball with 35 seconds left, 34 seconds, 30 seconds left. Because now for these three incompletions, there's going to be time left. You could have you could have called a play at the line of scrimmage and gotten a decent playoff and still had three incompletions after that. But now you only have three plays total. You come in here, you try to rip, fit a little slant in or post with a hook or option underneath it. Got to throw it in the end zone. Only got two guys going in the end zone. Really fortunate not to get picked here. So now we're down to 50%. Only got two downs, but we've only run one play. I mean, fortunate right there not to get picked. But the idea that we clocked the ball and left time on the clock where we could have run four plays is just it's inexcusable. It cannot happen. Next one here. I mean, only two people going in the end zone again. Now, certainly seven up top is getting held. But excuses aside, they're never going to call a penalty unless it's just blatant at the end of a game like this. Half throw away to Renfro. So really, we've had a spike, a half throw away, and a near pick. This is great prote protection. They're in drop eight. Russian three. And we're down to the last play. All because we spiked it. There's 17 seconds left. So on that spike, you could have used 10 seconds to call a decent play, signal a decent play that you want, and let it go. But instead, the Raiders felt like they had to relieve pressure by spiking the ball, as opposed to understanding where they are, not freaking out. Again, this is a contested throw. You have to make this throw. It's four down. But the reason you have to make this throw is because you don't have true four downs. If this is third down, you don't make that throw. You probably throw a wheel up top. But in you know just the pure play design here, this is really similar to the play that the Chargers uh, hit on the end of regulation last week, the you know, seven stop, turn them around. It's a good play down here in the red area. It's going to be tight contested throws. 
you have to make that throw. The interception is not the problem. The problem is the clock mismanagement, spiking the ball, losing 25% of your downs, and not giving yourself a true, real, full opportunity to win the game. So the next one, obviously, this is just an absolute disaster on many levels. 18 seconds left, first and 10. Cowboys marching with the ball. Now the 49ers are, I don't know who knows what they're doing on defense, not playing sideline defense, just let a easy, flat, layered, levels get to the sideline nice job from Dak. they're giving themselves a shot here you got two plays here they let you get out of bounds stop the clock great 14 seconds left now everybody knows what happens here second and one now the way that i at least saw the snippet of a press conference of mccarthy saying that this was their church play so church play to me means that you're going to get an easy completion over the ball and you're going to take a knee and you're going to hand the ball to the umpire and go. So once you start like fighting for extra yards, there's no difference between the 30 and the 25. So to me, the other part about the church play, so normally on the church play for me, is that it's usually to the back or to a check down. They basically come straight out, turn around, you throw it to them, they take a knee, they hand the ball to the umpire, you set the ball, you spike it, and you're on to kick a field goal to win, to finish a half. That's the church play. I've never seen the church play used to get five yards, to spike the ball to be five yards or ten yards closer for an end-of-game Hail Mary. There's no reason to do it. It doesn't make sense. It's not logical. The, the difference between five yards and ten yards here for that amount of danger, obviously so much danger that it doesn't work here, there's no like, hey, this is the right call, but the you know execution of it is not right. No. And also, I'm dating myself because when I used to do the church play in the league or was around the installation of it, you'd, you'd throw that ball over, he would kneel, but there would, the umpire was right here. You know, the white, the white hat was in the back, the ref, and the umpire was five yards from the ball. And on a pass, he'd step up and you would flip it to him. Well, now he's 15 yards back behind the ball with the white hat. So he's got to run all the way out here. So the operation of that play has changed. I'm telling you, I, I haven't been around it in 10 years. I They, they have to have, have talked about this. It's not the same as when the umpire was right here. You catch a check down, flip it to him, he sets it, and you go. There's no way you can get this for sure, 100% done with a quarterback draw in 14 seconds. There's just no way. And I'm not saying it couldn't happen. I'm saying... For sure, you know for sure you're going to get this. You can see him back there. He's 14 yards away from the ball. He's not following the ball. He's not following the ball. I mean, 14 seconds just for that guy to run up there. No offense to that guy. So now, five seconds. The ball's still not spotted. The, the umpire still hasn't touched it. He's got to move it because Dak put it on the middle of the hash or the center put it on the middle of the hash, and you snap the ball from the inside the hash, and they don't get it off. I mean, simply inexcusable. Again, the spike, if you're not going to spike, this doesn't happen. Does that make sense? Like, look where the ball is. First of all, NFL player needs to know that the ball is snapped on the inside of the hash. And that, that's my own pet peeve. But obviously, you have to hand it to the umpire, but the umpire is not back there. Or he is back there. He's not where he normally is. So here he, he puts it down and then he backs up to his old spot. This is a big difference. This is, the, this is the, the details of this church play. Ridiculous that he moved it like that too. I mean, legitimately ridiculous. Just move it inside to the hash. See where he pops right there? That's where their, their, their old position used to be. Just brutal. So just tying this thing all the way in, uh, these videos honestly are not that fun, although I do think that they do go a, a little bit uh, in the direction of at least pushing the, the needle to people better understanding clock mismanagement, clock management, what do we value, how important are timeouts, you know, are we burning timeouts for delay of games, why? You know, think about what's really important. Do you value the number of plays? Do you value end of half situational football? Or do you just, you know, I get it. Sometimes, you know, you 
They're burning a hole in your pocket. You don't want to take them into halftime. I think that there is time sometimes to give your defense or offense a rest if you know you're not going to have enough time to use all of them at the end of a half potentially. But to me, they're so important. They're, I just value plays so much and number of plays and opportunities for more plays that to burn a timeout is just clock management, you know, sacrilegion to me personally. And I get it. I acknowledge my own bias. I value them a lot. The spiking of the ball thing to me is just a, a misunderstanding of resources. It is simply trying to alleviate pressure. If you take it out of, if you understand that you can build to have answers to the to every spike it situation, except end of half between six and three seconds must run field goal unit on to win game or kick field goal. Besides for that, there really is not a time to ever spike the ball. And if you are spiking the ball, it just be means you either have managed that situation poorly or your team is not prepared enough to run a successful play in that situation. So you've managed that situation poorly again. So stop spiking the ball. Stop it. Please stop it. And then please hold on to your timeouts. I know these situations specifically weren't timeout relevant, but so many games come down to teams just not giving themselves an opportunity for something to happen at the end because they've mismanaged their timeouts earlier in the half. So thanks for hanging out through the rant. Please let me know if you thought that there were some holes in my logic or things didn't make sense or you think of other uh, times where you would want to spike the ball or use a timeout. As always, you know I certainly appreciate the support for the channel. It does mean a lot to me. I appreciate it. I will see you next time. Have a good one.